that you can have some sort of scalable execution system anchored into Ethereum for security. Uh, moving on uh, to December 2020. This was you know, right at the end of the year, but still in 2020, uh, we did a mainnet launch of Fuel V1 as the first optimistic rollup on mainnet Ethereum. And to this day, it's actually the, still the only system that could be considered a true rollup that is trustless uh, and permissionless. Uh, since then, uh, up until January 2022, we were essentially heads down building out uh, Fuel V2, which was an evolution of the protocol from a payments only platform to a general purpose smart contract execution platform. Uh, so we published our code on GitHub. Since then, the code has been developed. It has been open source and entirely developed, planned, and etc. all in public. Not a lot of projects actually do this entirely in public. Uh, we actually do all our development in public. Uh, uh, then, uh, in June of 2022, we launched a SwaySwap demo. SwaySwap is a port of Uniswap v1 to Sway, which is the high level language that I imagine most of you are here excited about. Uh, and along with the private testnet, and then in uh, September of 2022, so just a short month ago, we, le we released the beta one public testnet of the fuel protocol. This is actually completely permissionless. Anyone can use it, deploy a smart contract, run a transaction, and you can use it today. And now we're here, uh, DevCon October 2022, and what do we have and where are we gonna go? Let's talk about the three pillars of fuel uh, and what makes uh, the protocol so great to use and to build with, etc. So we have three fundamental pillars. One of them is performance. Uh, performance through parallel transaction execution. The second one is flexibility and waste reduction through the fuel virtual machine. And the last is a superior, in fact, unmatched development experience through Sway and Fork. And I'm going to be expanding on each of these pillars in the coming slides. So let's start with the first one, uh, performance through parallel transaction execution. This one is actually going to be the shortest of the three pillars I cover because it's actually fairly straightforward to explain, which is that you can see from the chart here, uh, the, while the number of transistors on CPUs has been increasing exponentially over the years, you know, this is Moore's law, the single threaded performance in the last you know, 10 plus years hasn't increased exponentially. It's kind of stalled, it's basically leveled off. What has increased exponentially, however, over the years has been the number of cores, right? So if you have a system that is sequential that can only leverage a single core, it's like you're running it on a 10 year old computer, right? That's not, a, that's not exactly a very good place to be when you're trying to build a global financial access, et cetera, system. Right? You really want to leverage the thing that is increasing exponentially year over year, and that is this parallel execution, multi-core, uh, multi multiple cores, multiple threads running in parallel. Uh, the fuel virtual machine is designed, and the fuel protocol is designed to be able to run transactions in parallel as opposed to the EVM, which unfortunately can only run transactions sequentially. This will lead to a vast increase in throughput, all else being equal, not because you need a more powerful computer, but just because you're using all the resources of your computer that in, uh, in the VM are just kind of sitting there wasted. So that's the, again, so that, that, was, that was short, because that's really all there is to it. Parallel transaction execution, massive increase in throughput. Now on to waste reduction uh, and impre increased performance on the single-threaded model. Oh, I guess I didn't, I didn't click this. And 
on a, on a wager function and improve performance within a single thread through the fuel virtual machine. So there's also some QR codes uh, here that you guys can scan if you so wish that link to some of our documentation around these things. Just in the slides will all be posted later on, so if you don't, if you don't want to scan them right now, they'll obviously be available. Uh, the fuel VM is fundamentally the EVM but improved. One amazing thing you can do in rollups is experiment with improvements, enhancements, etc. And there have been many, many EIPs and just ideas that have, didn't even make it to EIPs that have been proposed over the years for Ethereum, but that could never be implemented because of a need for backwards compatibility, also limited developer resources, you know, just worries of too, too much change too fast might be risky if you have a large code base already with a lot of tech debt. Right? But people still want these changes, they've been proposed. Uh, you know, if you take a rollup and you, know, you might say, oh, okay, I have an EVM equivalent rollup, I want to improve it. I'm going to start implementing EIPs to improve it. Right? I'm going to add account abstraction, I'm going to add parallel transaction execution, etc. That's fuel. Right? The fuel EVM is the EVM but improved. So if you're looking for the EVM of five years from now, that is the fuel EVM. Next one uh, stateless account abstraction. Some other projects give like entire talks about this one topic, but this is just one of the many things you get in Fuel, so it just gets one slide. Uh, Fuel supports account abstraction, but statelessly. Uh, stateful account abstraction is actually a denial service vector, so be wary of any project that says it has state stateful account abstraction. We have stateless account abstraction. What does it allow you to do? Well, like any account abstraction protocol, it allows you to define conditions under which a transaction is valid. Not conditions, you know, not logic of what the transaction will do, but actually conditions under which the, the transaction is valid or not. Uh, you know, the most obvious case, one thing you could do is use a different signature scheme, right? Uh, you, know, you can use Schnorr signatures if you want to. And this is actually what enables us to use any wallet whatsoever for fuel. Right, obviously, you know, we're building a, a native wallet that has all the bells and whistles, uh, you know, things like transaction simulation, you know, in a, a mode where you can like log in to you know, pretend to be any public key or any address, etc. But, you know, maybe someone doesn't want to install a new extension because they use Solana, right, and they have a Solana wallet, or they are use Ethereum and they have MetaMask, right? You can use any of these things and sign transaction on fuel because because of a kind of abstraction that allows you to define the con validity conditions that are basically, well, whatever signed message, whatever wallet uh, you want will, will do, it checks that for validity. And users are the ones that define the spending conditions, the validity conditions of this, not the protocol. In other words, anyone in the world can go in and just define some new condition and you know, it'll work with a new blockchain. Just like that. No protocol changes required, no hard fork required, no governance required. Just as a user, you just write it and you're done. Native assets. Uh, we all know that transferring tokens are a really painful thing, right? There's like super, extremely, actually for real this time, safe transfer from, right? Uh, needed because there's so, many, there's so many vulnerabilities in something as simple as just transferring a token properly. Uh, Fuel supports multiple, multiple assets, multiple assets natively. So every token is a native asset. Uh, so you could have like a DAI as a native asset, you could have USDC as a native asset, you could have well, Ether obviously as a native asset. Uh, and this, these native assets can be pushed with contract calls, which means you don't need the notion of token approvals. You can push them, they're first class citizens, just like how in Ethereum you can push Ether with a contract call. No token approvals, so not only are you getting better security from not needing you know, some sort of safe transfer from function, transfer from function, you also don't need token approvals, and this is actually a really big thing for users, not developers, uh, because as users, you know that token approvals are a really big UX pain point, right? It's due to approve the exact amount you want to spend. If you do, then you have to always add a second transaction every time before you interact with the protocol. It's more expensive, it's slower, it's worse UX. If you do infinite approvals, now the protocol has a bug, they can drain all your tokens, all of them. Whatever you infinite approved, right? With this, no need for native approvals, uh, no need for token approvals because you just push the native asset. Okay. Next is native safe math. Just make sure I'm on the right track. Uh, there's no need for a safe math library. 
there's no need for some runtime overhead that'll like add extra bytecode to check for safe math. The virtual machine itself supports safe math natively by default, uh, which means you get overflow protection for free. Uh, Cross-call shared memory. Uh, again, this is like, all of these things are either EIPs directly or like variations or inspired by EIPs. If you guys have heard of transient storage, right? Transient storage is storage that persists across contract calls within a single transaction. That's what this is, right? It's some piece of memory that is accessible across contract calls. Uh, in the Fuel virtual machine, all contract call frames share the same memory, uh, which allows you to do things like a completely in-memory re-entrancy guard. You don't have to set a storage slot for a re-entrancy guard, you can do it entirely in memory. And in fact, this is already implemented in the Sway standard library. There's a function to do an in-memory re-entrancy guard. So it's not just theoretical. Uh, it also allows you to pass large data around with co contract calls. So if you happen to do some data, data computation intensive task, you can do it just by passing a pointer to the data. Okay, next slide is transaction scripts. Uh, one of the pain points of approve and transfer from, in addition to you know, just approve is being painful, is they have to be done in two transactions. You need a transaction first to approve, make it complete, and then transfer from. And they have to be done in two transactions because an Ethereum transaction can only call a contract. It can't call two contracts or call two contracts and do some conditions and call a third contract or a fourth one depending on some condition. The Fuel protocol has transaction scripts, which are basically bytecode embedded directly in the transaction. And that is the entry point for execution, not the contract call. And the script is bytecode. It can do anything. It could call one contract, it could call two contract, it could co contracts, it could do an atomic approve, then transfer from. Obviously, for fungible assets, like I said before, there's you know, multiple native assets, so you don't actually, ironically, you don't need this for approve and transfer from atomically for native assets, but it will be useful for things like if you have a non-fungible token that does have approve and transfer from, then you can use, you, know, to, you can do that atomically in a single transaction thanks to transaction scripts. Uh, this also allows you to do things like you know, add liquidity to a pool for two different tokens, etc. So basically, anything that nowadays you would need multiple transactions to do, just due to the nature of you know, Ethereum only processing a single contract call per transaction, you could do it in a single transaction. And fuel. Okay, uh, we're getting to the end of this section. And last but not least, to reduce waste, uh, the virtual machine is register based and it uses 64 bit words. Uh, the 64 bit words, uh, instead of 256 bit words like what the EVM has, means a lot less waste, a lot, a lot closer to the metal when it executes, because you don't need big integer math every time you do an addition. You can just add two numbers together and you know, this just goes really fast. Uh, and combining these things together, including being register-based, means that you're executing a lot fewer instructions to do the same work, in addition to just executing faster. And that reducing the number of instructions executed to do, to do the same work is very important because gas accounting overhead is a huge portion of the overhead of the virtual machine. It's like enormous. Uh, and you want to reduce that overhead as much as possible to squeeze as much throughput as you can on the same physical hardware. So by being register-based, you greatly reduce that. And it doesn't really affect like the end user at all because you, know, you as a user, you know, this EVM is stack-based, but you don't care that it's stack-based if you're a user or a developer. It just is, it just works, right? Okay, on just Wayne Fork and an unmatched developer experience. Uh, standard library. So the language is very minimal. A lot of things are moved to the standard library. One example that we'll reuse in subsequent slides is the EC recover. Right, this thing here will recover the public key or the address. That's an implementation detail from a signature and a message hash. Right? In Solidity, this is part of the language itself. In other words, the compiler developers need to go in and add some special magic method into the compiler, embedded into the compiler, easy recover. Right? That does not exist in Sway. The Sway compiler and the Sway compiler team don't know what easy recover is. This exists in the standard library, which is written, the standard library is written in Sway. Although it's, it's software, not embedded into the compiler. 
Um, here's a QR code, I think, to link to the implementation of easier better. Why is this good? It's good because it means that the standard library can move very fast because you don't have to get the compiler developers to do something. This is in Sway. Any, if any of you can write Solidity, right, you, and you can write Sway, you can just add stuff to the, you can submit a PR and just add stuff to the standard library. You don't need to know how a compiler works, right? You just write Sway, which is writing a smart contract code. Uh, so it allows the language to move quickly because it's lean, and it allows the standard library to move quickly because it doesn't, you don't need to know how a compiler works uh, to contribute to the standard library. And this, basically, almost every function that isn't actually like, core to the language itself is in the standard library and not in the language itself. Next, uh, generics and some types. Uh, generics, you know, they look, I mean, is the, the, the angle brackets, right? Uh, so you can define the type of a thing later. Uh, some types are, you know, either one or the other, uh, right? They're uh, kind of like unions. Uh, combine them together and you can get things like a result, for instance, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Uh, but generics are very good because they, they, they allow you to reuse code, reuse logic, without having to like, duplicate code. Right? There's a safe math library right, for Solidity, but if you want to use safe math for like a UN64 instead of a UN236, you just have to like copy all that code and change the type. Right? If you have generics, you don't have to do that because you can just make logic generic over any type that supports some functions, like say an addition, uh, and then you know instantiate instantiate with different types. Uh, so it allows much easier code reuse uh, without having to. Well, it allows it allows code reuse period uh, for things that are the same logic but in different types. Uh, now, why do we care about results specifically? Uh, why is this important? We're going to go back to our example of EC Recover. On Ethereum and Solidity, uh, the EC Recover function will return something special if there's an error. Can someone yell out what that something special is? Zero. Okay, someone, someone says zero. Perfect, right. So if the signature is invalid, then EC Recover will return a magic value of zero. You know, the address zero has you know, signed over this message hash with a signature. Yeah. Obviously, that's not true because you know if you, if you knew that if you knew the private key to the address zero, things would be very bad. But the easy recover doesn't tell you anything explicitly, right? There's this magic value, and if you don't remember to check this, then someone can pretend they're from address zero, right? And maybe like do a bunch of nasty stuff. And in fact, just a few months ago, a contract forgot to do this, and I think it got exploited, or maybe it wasn't exploited. At least it was still there as a bug in the code. Uh, with results, uh, you can actually wrap the return of things. So EC Recover in Sway, which again the standard library function, does not return a value. It returns a result over a value and an error, right? So if the if the signature is invalid, it's not going to return zero. It's going to return an error. And if you want to actually get into the value, you have to unwrap the result, and you have to do this. Otherwise, the compiler just straight up won't let you compile your code. In other words, you have to handle that error, and the compiler will force you to handle that error explicitly. Uh, you know, in, in Solidity, that's not the case. You have to actually go manually remember to check that zero value. And you know, there's other places where this happens. So having generic and some types allows us to have results, along with other things, and this allows for explicit error handling, which means safer code, because the compiler tells you you don't have to go and remember yourself. Okay, next one, type inference. We probably all hate writing types of things, especially when those types are long, especially relevant when you have generics. Uh, there's a let keyword. Now, an alternative would have been var, I guess. But you know, there's been some bike shedding, I think on Twitter I saw fairly recently on this let keyword. So, so it has a let keyword, uh, and this allows you to have type inference. Uh, right, we use the same type system as Rust, uh, so you can just, you know, whatever's on the right, it can be inferred. Uh, you have to actually write out very few types, and if you look at our standard library, I think type inference is used quite a bit throughout it, so that would be a good example of how f how you don't have to write that many types everywhere. And on to... Okay, ne next one is namespace storage access. In Solidity, uh, storage variables and regular variables are all in the same namespace. And if you have a storage variable foo and a local variable foo, and you go like you know foo dot whatever, you know which one are you accessing? 
right? Likewise, what happens if you have two variables that are close in name, right? You have like, I don't know, count and CMT, let's say, right? You can use the wrong one by accident, right? You intended to increment something in storage, but you incremented it only locally or vice versa. Uh, in Sway, storage accesses are namespaced with a storage dot keyword, uh, which means if you want to access a storage variable, you explicitly have to write out storage dot. This means you can just look at the code, typos or not, uh, and you can see what parts of the code are actually touching storage versus not. Right, so additional explicitness means additional safety. Next one is exhaustive pattern matching. This one was implemented uh, quite quickly by one of our amazing compiler engineers, Emily. Uh, for, so, for those of you who aren't familiar with pattern matching, it's a match statement, right? And it allows you to exhaustively enumerate all the possible cases. So let's say you're matching on a Boolean, the exhaustive cases are true and false, right? And if you only matched on true, the compiler would tell you, hey, you haven't matched exhaustively. Uh, this means that unlike in Solidity, where you have to do an if-else chain, and hey, if you forget to check a case in your, you know, in the, in your state machine, right, uh, for your contract, if you forget to check a case, well, too bad, so sad, the compiler tells you nothing, right? Uh, with exhaustive match expressions, well, not only is it cleaner, because it's all like a single thing instead of a chain, uh, it's also exhaustive, and the compiler will tell you if you missed a case. Next one is zero-cost abstractions. Uh, this is kind of a first-class notion in the Sway language and the Sway compiler uh, that the Solidity compiler doesn't really do. One example of a zero-cost abstraction or just zero-cost things in general, it means moving stuff from runtime to compile time wherever possible. That's what the ethos is really about. One example is, well, what happens if you could check method payability at compile time instead of at runtime? Right? The Solidity compiler will actually inject some runtime code into every method that is non-payable, right? This is a runtime cost, it's bad, and that's why optimizers will actually just add payable to every public method uh, to avoid that runtime cost and just say, okay, read the, read the documentation, right? Read the docs in the function and don't send ether to this, to this method, right? But you can always do it at compile time, which is what uh, Sway will do, right? The Sway compiler is that you actually check at compile time. Is someone trying to send some non-zero value of any asset? not just ether, uh, to some non-payable method. Okay, uh, and uh, another, last but not least, I think I'll zoom through since I have one minute left, is reentrancy. Reentrancy ex exploits are still happening to this day, six plus years later after the DAO. Tooling should pick this up, but it doesn't. The Sway compiler will <coughs> warn you if your contract has some potential reentrancy vulnerability because it violates the check effects interaction pattern or other patterns, the Sway compiler will actually warn you. So goodbye are the days of reentrancy vulnerabilities because we now have two of them that can warn us about that. All right, and last but not least, not on the language side, but on the tooling side, we have Fork, the Fuel Orchestrator, which is the equivalent of Foundry or Cargo or NPM. This allows you to do a variety of things, including building, deploying, Managing dependencies. Oh, I have a plug. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, it allows you to build, deploy, manage dependencies in the same way Cargo does, so no weird Git modules. Uh, it has an Australian formatter, tasks, a, a language server. We actually had a language server before uh, Solidity did. So if you want to, there's a QR code to link to the Sway book. If you want to learn how to write Sway and dive in uh, head first, this will take you straight there. I'm going to leave it up for a few more seconds. And then, with a few seconds left, I'd like to close out the slide by thanking not only you guys, but each and every one of these 65 contributors in the Fuel Labs team that has brought Fuel to where it is today. Thank you.